Hi, I'm Max Kaiser. This is the Kaiser Report. Sexual favors for Chicken McNuggets. Oh my goodness, I can hardly wait to get that story. But first, let's talk about the sinking ship. Max, you're not talking about the global economy, or are you? Because that's our first headline. Cruise ship captain refused order to return to a ship. So more information is emerging about the Costa Concordia and the captain's role in abandoning ship. Now, when something first went wrong, the port in Italy called the ship and he said, no, no problem. There's no problem here. In fact, it's just a technical error. So let's draw a parallel to the global economy because what happened when the stuff first started going wrong? For years, we knew there was something wrong. And what did Jamie Dimon, what did Lloyd Blankfein, what did they say? Yeah, they said, nothing's wrong. You know, just carry on. Uh, they were telling the regulators, oh, nothing to see here. People are dropping off and drowning in a sea of derivatives and they're doing nothing about it. So this guy abandoned ship and he jumps in the lifeboat or he trips into the lifeboat. People are dead. I, I would imagine his next job will be skippering an oil tanker for Exxon. He'll probably be skippering some huge oil tanker and they can run it aground on Puget Sound. That'll be his next job because his price on the open skipper market just went down. Okay, so let's go back to the story here because when Captain Shatino told the Coast Guard, told the people who are regulating the law of the sea, when he told them it was just a technical error, but in fact was using that time to get into a lifeboat and escape, well, once the Coast Guard found out, did they, you know, provide him with more liquidity or more coverage? No, the guy, the captain in the Coast Guard, Captain Gregorio DeFalco, shouted at him, you go aboard, it is an order, don't make any more excuses, you have declared the abandoning of the ship, now I am in charge. Now that's what Timothy Geithner, that's what Ben Bernanke, that's what George W. Bush and then Obama should have done as in control of the U.S. economy and banking system, they should have said, Lloyd Blankfein, Jamie Dimon, all you other schmageggies, you have abandoned ship, get off, I'm in charge. All right, if, had Ben Bernanke been in charge of rescuing the cruise ship, his solution would have been to take a boat out to the ship with a crowbar and make the hole in the boat and all the problems bigger. That's the central bank solution to the global economic crisis, is to make the hole bigger with artificially low interest rates. This is what's making the situation even worse. And of course, in Europe, we find out that they're going to expand the European Central Bank's credit lines by a trillion euro. That's the exact opposite of what is required to bring some of this accountability that you're talking about. The maritime law stepped in. People are drowning. They're obviously dying. So maritime law came in and said, OK, we have to impose the law. Now, in the global economy, people are dying from the derivatives that are being created, that are making the top one-tenth of one-tenth percent fabulously rich, and everyone else is choking on their own fiscal vomit, and the regulators are making that easier for the criminals. So this Captain Shatino, he's brought to shore. He's Now everybody knows he's abandoned ship. His excuse, Costa Concordia captain says he tripped and fell into lifeboat. And that's the reason why he abandoned ship. That sounds exactly like the excuses that Lloyd Blankfein and Jamie Dimon gave to Congress. I tripped and fell into tarp. No, the, well, the, the analogy would be the one that they always use is the market did it. We, the market's unpredictable. We don't know what the market's going to do. And when the market did what it was going to do, we had to do what we did. Even though they themselves are manipulating the market to create the effects that make them coincidentally incredibly rich and everyone else poor. That's just a coincidence. But this is the same uh, kind of excuse that, well, this guy's saying he tripped into the lifeboat and sailed away. And Lloyd Blankfein and Jamie Dimon are saying, well, the market accidentally made me a billionaire. I don't know how that happened. You know, there's further parallels here, Max, because it's emerged as well that he did, he's now confessed that he did deviate from course to go closer to an island to salute to his friend. Well, he said, he's done this before and it's always gone okay, but he said, I don't know why it happened. I was a victim of my instincts. Okay, well, here's an analogy. <laughs> we know that Davos is coming up. A lot of bankers go to Davos. They, the price for hookers at Davos has never been higher. So to get that really fine hooker material, they do stupid banking tricks. Like they'll encumber a bank with a few hundred billion dollars worth of debt to get, 
generate a huge fee to avoid that hooker. And that's pretty much what happens at Davos. And here's a guy running a cruise ship. He sees some chick on the beach. Hey, baby, look at me. <laughs> oh, a few people are dead. Well, any accountability? In maritime law, yes. On Wall Street in the city of London, no. Well, he said he was a victim of his instincts. John Corzine is using that ex same excuse. Oh, it's just my testosterone. I'm a victim of my being an alpha male. Now, as no regulators will step up either, they've abandoned ship. There is one person out there, and that is Mecca Kaiser. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> Let's turn to this video sent to us by our viewer, Lindsay Adams. Maxilla stalking the globe. I tell you, RT should use that as an ad on RT. Send them an email. Tell them you want that as their official ad for the show on that network. So, as we've said, the global economy is listing. It's sinking. And what do the regulators do over and over? They don't arrest the captains. They don't fire the captains and tell them that they're no longer in charge. No, here's a tweet from Jim Cramer. IMF just proposes one trillion increase in lending. That's what's needed. IMF stepping up to the table, real heat. So in fact, the IMF expanded their lending to a trillion. Now they're looking for 600 billion more. Right, well this is uh, the Jim Cramer stunt we saw in 2008. Remember when Lehman went bust? and there was a uh, liquidity started to freeze up in the system and it looked like banks might have to pay for the mistakes that they made. Jim Cramer went on CNBC and he did a hissy fit. Yeah, yeah let's, let's cut to Jim right now. This is what he did in 2008. And Bernanke is being an academic. It is no time to be an academic. It is time to get on the Bear Stearns call. Listen, open the darn Fed window. He has no idea how bad it is out there. He has no idea. He has no idea. I have talked to the heads of almost every single one of these firms in the last 72 hours, and he has no idea what it's like out there. None! Now, Kramer, he got his way. Remember, right after that, Paulson went in front of Congress and said, give us three quarters of a trillion, or we're going to declare a martial law. That came out in the, in the testimony later, which turned into, that was TARP, and it turned into, when you add all the extra TARP features, almost 15 trillion in bailouts. We know from FOIA request, Freedom of Information Act, that there was a seven trillion chunk that went directly into the bank's pocket and another seven trillion of ancillary that kind of was distributed to these guys. Very simply, had that kind of money been used to bail out the homeowners, A, the recession depression would have been over already two years ago. B, Obama would have come out like somebody who's a populist representing the people and not somebody in the pocket of the bankers. And C, Kramer would have been taken off the air by now because he's a charlatan and a scam and his hedge fund and his recommendations have produced an exact uh, gain over the past five years of negative six or seven percent, according to my calculations. So, but Max, this issue of the IMF able to expand their credit facility up to a trillion dollars, that's the equivalent of the captain of the ship saying, oh, it's just a little technical issue, as if the IMF has money, as if any of the member nations have money to dedicate it to this facility. UK faces requests for 19 billion pounds as IMF boosts bailout fund to one trillion dollars. Uh, didn't we just cover the fact that debt to GDP ratio in the UK is a thousand percent? Where do they get 19 billion? They um, engage in massive off-balance sheet, Enron-like, special purpose entity fraud. They create this uh, debt uh, at the, simultaneously uh, creating an off-balance sheet entity that they hope at some point will be made good when the economy reserve, resumes growing. Well, this is basically uh, the model of the arson who is selling the charcoal of the buildings after he burns them down, essentially. The UK doesn't have this money. 
They, they cook it up completely in the shadow banking system. The multi-hundred trillion dollar derivatives market is going to be expanded by another hundred trillion dollars. And that is financial repression, financial oppression. Savers end up footing the bill. If you have any capital, you're treated like dirt in this economy. If you're a, if you're a, a welfare queen like Wall Street in the city of London, they roll out the red carpet. But while they're distracting you with these so-called technical measures like increasing credit facilities up to a trillion dollars that they don't have, in the meantime, they're not only abandoning ship, but they're actually preventing you from ever being able to jump off the ship, even try to save yourself, let alone them coming to your rescue. Because I want to turn to a little clip here from Chris Hedges, a former war reporter who is now an independent journalist and commentator. And here he is on Democracy Now! being interviewed about the National Defense Authorization Act. He is suing the government to try to stop that. And he notes that the intelligence community in front of Congress testified that they don't actually need the authorization that was being granted to them. So he asked why. And I think we have to ask if the security establishment did not want this bill. And the FBI director Mueller actually goes to Congress and, and says publicly they don't want it. Why did it pass? What, what pushed it through? And I think without question, uh, the corporate elites understand that uh, things uh, certainly economically are about to get much worse. I think they're worried about the Occupy movement expanding. And uh, I think that in the end, and this is a, a supposition, um, they don't they don't uh, trust the police to protect them, and they want to be able to call in the army. And if this bill goes into law and it's slated to go into law in March, they will be able to do that. The news is tightening, uh, and, and the wealth confiscation is accelerating. It is. So, Max, you brought up this Chicken McNugget story, so we're going to go to this here. Woman offered sexual favors for Chicken McNuggets, police say. So, a Los Angeles woman was seen going from car to car outside a McDonald's drive through And what it turns out is that she was offering sexual favors in exchange for Chicken McNuggets. With barbecue sauce? <laughs> I'm not sure about that. I don't know that. if that's worth it. Well, she was trading sexual favors. Now, what about Greece, which has traded their sovereignty for Chicken McNuggets? Goldman Sachs won, Greece lost. And a move bound to leave many Greeks and scholars aghast, Greece's culture ministry said Tuesday it will open up some of the debt-stricken country's most cherished archaeological sites to advertising firms and other ventures. Well, we, we called this so many, so many months ago. They, uh, they have income producing assets. Greek, Greece is not bankrupt. Uh, they were the victim of a leveraged buyout by hostile raiders on Wall Street. Now they'll be converting their assets, income producing assets will be going into the pockets of foreign bankers and the people have lost their sovereignty and they'll be bankrupt. And being in the streets as they were, that was, you know, a nice show. But there was no coup d'etat, there was no revolution, the government's still in place, so you lost. Goldman Sachs won. All right, Stacey Herbert, thanks so much for being on the Kaiser Report. Thank you, Max. Don't go away, much more coming your way, so stay right there. Welcome back to the Kaiser Report. I'm Max Kaiser. Time now to go to London and talk with former Compliance and Market Supervision Director of the International Petroleum Exchange, Chris Cook. Welcome to the Kaiser Report. Hello again, Max. All righty, Chris Cook, you predict the imminent end of the oil market. Why and how? Well, in simple terms, the oil market has become, uh, like several other markets, uh, almost completely uh, financialized by the participation of um, what has been called uh, passive uh, investors by a guy called Mike Masters. He calls them passive investors. Uh, in the, they uh, also called inflation hedging investors. And uh, the participation of these investors in, in, in not just in the oil markets, but commodity markets and equity markets have completely distorted the operation of these markets. Right. And okay. You talk about the financialization of these markets. It's a curious term, the word passive, because the, uh, as Warren Buffett calls it, these are weapons of mass destruction, financial destruction. So there's a very uh, aggressive destabilization going on to make a very few people on Wall Street in the city of London exorbitantly rich while destroying the underlying fabric of these economies. But is it safe to say that um, the connection between the price that you see, the paper price, has absolutely nothing to do with the real price of the real stuff? I think what has happened 
is that the uh, the price of the physical, the, the actual stuff that we, we, we use that gets refined and, uh, into gasoline and, and, and then we drive, we drive around using it, has become inflated. Um, it is because basically the participation of these funds in the market has acted to raise the price uh, to uh, a level at which um, basically the, the demand starts to get destroyed. Um, this happened back in 2008 and, and uh, I gave evidence to the Treasury Select Committee back then, uh, but they lost interest when the price collapsed. And in 2009, Max, it, it basically happened again. The price got pumped up um, and was kept up. And you see, what is being missed here is that we're not talking about speculation. We're not talking about people taking a risk so that they can get a transaction profit. What we're talking about here, Max, is people who want anything but dollars, right? They basically see dollars being printed, or they did see dollars being printed by the multiple billion. They saw interest rates at zero percent and they thought, well, we'll buy equities, we'll buy gold, we'll buy commodities, we'll buy food, we'll buy anything but dollars. And that is what happened. That's what led to the bubble inflating. That bubble is now becoming, it's being reversed um, and the money has been based in the last three to six months has been flowing out of the market again back to the dollar back to the US Treasury bills and uh, what we are about to see this was a subject of a recent article I wrote uh, it, in my view is a collapse of the oil price exactly as happened in 2008 for exactly the same reasons this uh, inflation hedging money this uh, risk averse money is flowing out of the markets and what we will see within the first six months of this year in my view and this is I've gone on record saying it Max so you know um, I'm putting <laughs> my money where my mouth is sort of thing I believe we're going to see a collapse of the price probably as low as 55 60 dollars maybe even less all right let's talk about Goldman Sachs for a second uh, they, their role in this commodities index and the relationship to BP in terms of the problems you see in the oil market. Very interesting story you delved into on your recent piece. Well, this goes back a long way. It goes back almost 20 years. Um, it was Goldman Sachs who in basically came up with what was called the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index. Uh, it's since been sold off, but the GSCI was basically the idea that you could invest, a, a fund could invest in a, a basket of uh, commodities of which energy was, crude oil was the biggest by far, and, and that the, the genius piece of marketing which they came up with was to basically sell this to investors as what they called an inflation hedge. So, th and they, they, they sold this concept of, of actually hedging inflation by investing directly in, in commodities by creating this fund, the, the GSCI fund. And then in 1995, um, what happened um, was that from that time onwards, um, Goldman Sachs and BP were essentially, I, I say, joined at the head, joined at the head. Um, they had the same chairman, uh, Peter Sutherland, he was the head of the WTO, very well connected. He was the chairman of both organisations for 12 years. And from 1999, um, Sir John Brown, uh, Lord Brown, sorry, um, he was the, also on the Goldman Sachs board for, I think, some of the most profitable years for BP and Goldman Sachs um, during that, that really sort of happy time which they had. And the reason that this worked, Max, I think, uh, was that they essentially, uh, being very astute people, um, BP realised that they were always hedging their production. They were always selling futures contracts. They were always um, protecting themselves against a fall in the price by selling futures contracts. And they had a very, very um, big um, book of contracts. And I remember that from my IPE days. This is how far back this goes. Whereas GSCI, the fund which came into the market, um, took a, a long-term position on the other side of the market. What they were doing was um, they were basically taking on oil risk and offloading the risk of holding dollars. And if you think about it, what BP were doing was laying off the risk of holding oil and taking on the risk of holding dollars. They were, so BP were hedging their production and Goldman Sachs' customers were um, 
uh, protecting themselves against inflation. And with that relationship, um, which br I think broadened and deepened over a period of years, and, and in my view, um, it's difficult to say exactly what was going on um, because it was all done between consenting adults, you know. Um, but I, I, I would be, as a former regulator myself, I must say, I, I would be very interested in, 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 in running back through all the interaction between those two firms from 1995 until 2008 or even, even more recently. Right, yeah. so, you, so you have a bit of a false laddering effect uh, with these two parties acting uh, in, in coordination with each other to completely obliterate the price signal mechanism and manipulate markets. Now, of course, viewers of this program know Peter Sutherland from his role in getting the Irish government to throw the nation into perpetual debt servitude by bailing out Anglo-Irish <laughs> bondholders. So here's an all-star all -star in the world of financial crooks, Peter Sutherland. So tell us what, dark, uh, what is uh, dark inventory and why does it matter? What's happening is that people are essentially leasing, they're, they're selling oil today and they're buying it back a month from now. This is the physical oil. They're essentially, Max, leasing the oil. And they're not doing it on exchange. They're doing it between consenting adults uh, completely opaquely. What's happening is essentially some of the inventory that producers have uh, and it could be BP, it could be almost anybody, it could be the Saudis, it could be many producers. Uh, no one knows exactly who it is, but it is definitely going on. The only people transparent in this are essentially Shell, who have entered transparently into a relationship with ETF securities um, to um, essentially lease their oil um, and, and give price exposure, the oil price exposure, to, to the customer. Uh, but most people are not doing this transparently. So what's happening, Max, is there is oil, which the entire industry thinks is owned by the producer, but it's not. It's been sold already to somebody else. And what that means is when they see the price going a certain way in the physical market or the forward market, they think, ah, well, we'll sell this. And then what happens is what they don't realize is that the person who bought it from them actually already has control of the oil and they get what's called squeezed. What we're talking about, Max, is a market that has become entirely corrupted, entirely corrupted. Mike Masters, uh, he, he's a, a well-known commodity uh, expert. He gave evidence to Congress in June 2009 and he brought the world down on his head, the entire financial world down on his head, because he was saying exactly what I'm saying. He was talking that he was saying that passive investors, as he called them, have no place in the commodity markets. In fact, no place in any market because they destroy the price mechanism. If you think about it, Max, the normal price mechanism, you know, speculators, traders, they buy and they sell at a profit or try to or they sell and they buy back at a profit. And it's a two way market and it's a zero sum game. That's the market that everybody thinks they're in. But the real market out there has been corrupted by the presence of people in it who are not buying to make a profit. They're buying long term to avoid loss. And this is just not visible. People, the general public, are participating in a market that is basically dead. It's a zombie. It's, it's, it's a walking dead market. Okay, so just to uh, emphasize your thesis here, we're looking for a trap door to open up under the price of oil and a, pr and a price uh, d moving down to the $55 a barrel range. Now, you mentioned Saudi Arabia there for a second. So, Chris Cook, when the Arab Spring broke uh, recently um, in countries all over Mideast, North Africa, Saudi Arabia immediately... Uh, gave their population a huge uh, bonus, a cash bonus, to try to appease them. And this worked pretty well uh, based on this high price of oil. If, in fact, your scenario plays out, oil drops to $55 a barrel, uh, and the Saudis can no longer buy off their population with the oil cash, are they going to be in the line of fire for a revolution, as we've seen in other North African and Mideastern countries? I believe that is the very reason what you know, the price dropped in 2008 before from $147 to 35. 
And I think it's fair to say that there were crisis meetings, all, you know, OPEC and all the rest. And I think what's happened has been a reaction to that. You know, they, they, they basically entered into this sort of uh, arrangement because they're, they're prepared to give away some of the upside in protection against some of the perceived downside. And yes, if the price does fall, um, they're, they're going to need to look again at, well, how, how on earth could they, you know, reinflate the price um, to levels at which they're comfortable. And of course, um, that's not difficult for OPEC to do. I guess it's safe to say that Saudi Arabia is mostly in the paper business and more so than actually in the oil business. I think they're a lot more in the paper business, Max, than people realize. But I have no proof. Uh, I would just be very interested in seeing the transactions that go on in that market. All right, fair enough. Chris Cook, we're out of time, but thanks so much for being on the Kaiser Report. It's been a pleasure, Max. Thank you. All right, and that's going to do it for this edition of the Kaiser Report with me, Max Kaiser, and Stacey Herbert. I want to thank my guest, Chris Cook. If you want to send me an email, please do so at kaiserreport at rttv.ru. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter. Till next time, Max Kaiser saying bye, y'all.